What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, January 15th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are your top headlines for the day. Hertz cites weak demand, high damage costs amid decision to downsize EV fleet. Next article up, would you buy a Ford self-driving car that would automatically drive to a repo company if you missed a payment? Ooh, I'm not sure. Next up, the price Germany pays for net zero. Next up, ESG becomes corporate America's new taboo. What is next? Next article up, the massive gas outage threatens millions of Americans' energy supplies amid the Arctic storm. Hope everybody's staying warm. And finally, in the new segment, Biden admin issues new natural gas tax in latest fossil fuel crackdown. We will then shift over to finance and quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas markets. We saw prices rise um, and then fall mainly after um um, some strikes in the Middle East and some oil being diverted from the Red Sea. We did see rig counts drop on Friday, so we will cover all that in a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, and the director and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Stuart Turley, I'm turning it over to you, man. What do we got? Hey, let's get rocking and rolling. Let's go to Hurt Sites Weak Demand uh, Cost and Decision to Downsize EV Fleet. Hey, I'll tell you what, this is huge because uh, Hertz said that it expects to book 245 million in charges in the fourth quarter, sending it stock. Ooh, there's a there's the IR guy of the week. Let's see what he comes up with after this earnings announcement. They're down six percent in early trading, and uh, its rival Avis is uh, also looking at this. And Michael, this was triggered by insurance. And as these things, you can't sell these things uh, because the amount, you know, $24,000 is the average cost of a new battery. Let's come in here. Uh, So it's insurance and then the resale. They lose resale because that's how Hertz uh, really does. Here's a quote in here. Uh, Going forward, the company will continually actively manage the total size of its EV fleet, as well as the allocation of EVs among customer segments, including leisure, corporate, government, and ride share. (laughs) Yeah, I I think it's important to point out that, yes, it was an insurance, but they also mentioned in their regulatory filing that collision and damage costs remain high for all of their EVs. Why? All of those special tools that it costs to replace and the specialized knowledge to repair and layering on top of the low resale value, it's of course they were going to have to take a charge. So you wonder if this is the first domino to fall among a lot of these car renters, and you're going to see this. We know that Ford Motor Company posted a less than um, expected quarterly earnings down about 1.3 percentage points, which adjusted for about a $1.3 billion loss coming from their EV unit. We covered that a few months ago or a few weeks ago. So pretty insane what's going on. And and, I mean, we're sitting right here in the midst of, as we record this, um, over the course of this Arctic storm that's going all through the Midwest right now. We hope everybody's staying warm. Now's not the time you want an EV. No. Uh, Ford, this is a quote, said the customers interested in EVs were unwilling to pay the vehicle's premium prices. And the company paused, Michael, billions of dollars in long-term investment in EVs. Uh, What's a few billion between friends? Mm, I call it profit. (laughs) All right. What's next? (laughs) Let's go to the next one. Hey, Michael, this might be a feature, though, that Hertz and Avis and everybody would want to use. But would you buy a Ford self-driving car that automatically would drive to a repo company if you missed a payment? This is not headline news. I didn't, I found this on a little local TV station. So I embedded the video here and I just thought it was absolutely who the, the uh, newscasters from the local channel were like going, huh? can you imagine having your car wake up in the middle of the night and go, 
you a bad man and then run out and go to the the collection agency. So, so yeah. So, so to bring you guys into the fold here, Ford has filed a patent for self-driving cars that would basically drive the car away from the owner after series of mispayments in the, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, to be honest, and it's something I didn't even think about when it comes to self-driving and, well, and this, I mean, self-driving and EV cars are different, but it's one of those second order effects that we like to talk about of, oh, yeah, if the, you miss a payment now, instead of having the guy come up and, and try to slip your car into a in, in into a tow oh, truck yeah. as fast as possible, you just all of a sudden look out and just see your car just driving yeah. away. Now, here's where I bring up a couple warnings. They said the first infractions would be uh, the heater going on uh, really bad. the And then the sound. No, they didn't. Ob- they were just going to blast you with heat in the summer. Oh, yeah. And then they'd play rap where they would play some music that is not in your, you know, your uh, venue. You know, some people hate country western. Some people hate rap. They would just go to whatever you never listen to and play it really For loud. some people, they would just blast the Energy News Beat podcast 24-7. Hey, there's some advertising for you. Hey, there here's another is. problem, there is, though, actually. is, is uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, and we know that the EVs are capable of being hacked. So what happens if uh, Big Brother, You here's where it gets really, uh, once they get the disinformation done, can you imagine putting something out on Twitter and they go, you bad, you very bad. And then they take, that almost sounded like Elmer Fudd, they take the car and it goes away, it goes into government yep prison your car because you put something bad on twitter hey let's go to the next one what is the price that pay germany pays for net zero michael for years you and i have always been laughing at germany you can't buy this kind of entertainment especially when california and new york follow germany down off the cliff the lemmings the construction of new energy uh G, uh, generation, which is a small part of the net zero transition, the largest estimate from the Institute of Energy uh, Economics at the University of Cologne that is Germany faces 60 billion, 65.5 billion US of financing gap up to 2030 to build sufficient power generation. That's not even including the higher cost that the cost per kilowatt hour that these things cost. Because again, everybody's going out there saying you got it. You can put in low cost uh, renewable. Well, Michael, for every nameplate that you have, you have to add 180 more of one wind turbine just because of the nameplate. So uh, it, then you also have to put in the natural gas and or the coal Germany just announced yesterday or the day before they're increasing their coal production because they don't want to get mugged. <laughs> All the German farmers are protesting and they realize they're about to get uh, thrown out. Kind of like a Frankenstein movie where you always see the villagers come running in. But, hey. what the, but what this article really does is point out the fact that these numbers are being hidden from the public. I mean, separate research that they quoted from this other think tank estimated the cost of beaching net zero between now and the end of 2030 will approach 1.9 trillion dollars. That's 240 billion per year. Again, right. for those keeping score at home, it's it's that's what's really going to it, it. It's this whole thing with with this net zero push. It's I would love to get to net zero, but it's unfeasible to think we can spend 240 billion a year, and that's only the cost to basically get the new generation what about replacing all the stuff that goes down and and you know if you're talking about 10 year life cycles for renewables well stuff that was installed from 2020 it's already it's going to start cycling out here oh yeah and that's where the, all the renewable the solar panels and everything is going into the junkyards and it's all toxic um, it's just amazing. And, and so you're going to see some major pushbacks, uh, on all this around the world. I'm just hoping the U S doesn't, uh, get into some problems. We're going to talk about that on another, uh, story here in this, uh, news thread. Let's go to the next one, Michael. 
uh, ESG becomes the corporate America's taboo. What's next? Michael, you and I have been covering this for several months now, and if not more than six, ESG was always talking about, and you always heard the, the um, consultants talking about ESG, kind of like your favorite consultants, Bob and his other brother, Bob. Um, the shift away from ESG is evidenced by the reduced mentions in the earnings call, changes in corporate reports, and the closure of relevant, uh, relevant rel related investment policies. Mm -hmm. Here's a quote. ESG has gone from the buzzword uh, that every investment advisor or company or government official had to be familiar with and append to every single piece of business they were involved with to becoming the latest dirty word in corporate America. There's uh, one of the topics was in the new uh, wall street journal article. It's amazing. Well, the sleight of hand that this article also points out that they're doing is rephrasing it from ESG to responsible business. Right. And, and this came from, are you ready? Our buddies over there at BlackRock, uh, because they want to keep their job uh, so they can rule the world, and also Bill Gates. When Bill Gates comes out and says, well, we're not going to be quite dead yet from the climate change, because there is no climate change, and then you have Larry Fink coming out and saying, well, ESG also includes investing in nuclear and oil and gas. You're like, that is hypocrisy at its finest. Um, anyway, so, uh, 30 billion had been shaved off the value of clean energy stocks the previous six months, 30 billion. <laughs> As we always say, what's a few billion between friends, oh, man, no what kidding. a scam. What's next? Let's go to the massive gas outage that threatens millions of Americans energy supplies amid arctic storm and this is also coupled with craziness going up in alberta to canada they have had the heavy heavy push going to um uh, renewables and their gas shortage is also out this is up in the upper um western portion and i've also included a, a thing that was last night and you had it was lighting up like a, a warning, you know, on a on a ship. Mm -hmm. You had roughly in Oregon two hundred and twelve thousand. There's about half a million people on this map that were out of power, and it could have gone uh, even worse. So you got to have natural gas to keep the grid up. And uh, let's see the storage. For, facility that came out that had enough gas to power upward of 6 million homes. If at all was used to generate electricity, the gas network also had supplies for heating furnaces like city in Seattle freeze in the coldest temperature in the city in 14 days. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, when natural gas is going down, it's not good. I think the one thing to point out is that a lot of the reasons for the power outages, when you get into like specifically like in Texas and you get into you know, places where one, the infrastructure is not quite, uh, wasn't quite designed to be this cold. I think it's, it's crazy. It's 15 degrees here. That's cold here in Dallas. I, I, I come from Denver though, three feet of snow. You got to move out of your apartment that day sucks to suck. You're moving. It doesn't shut. So there is a, is a shift of perspective that I think we have to think like cold weather areas are designed to hold this. You also have to realize, you know, the grid Grid generation and then to your actual where you live is a whole nother thing because what happened in Oregon was winds knocked down a lot of the supply coming from your central power stations to the actual end user. So we also have to realize that places like, again, Colorado, Wyoming, Colorado, place, you know, um, you know, mid, you know, Minnesota, places that are used to freezing temperatures have a lot of this worked out. So, uh, you know, we, we can't blame this all specifically on the, you know, grid. what it is, is just bad design. You know, we, you should always design your systems to until the worst possible conditions that you could come across. And that I think is where Texas specifically got itself into trouble is it never retrofitted anything for, you know, it just assumed that the once in 100 year flood, as it's called, you know, the, the 100 year flood only show would never show up. Well, it does show up and then you get in trouble. Right.
Well, the Biden administration is about to just absolutely make it all worse. Uh, you got to love a quality administration. This last article, uh, Biden administration issues a new natural gas tax in the latest fossil fuel crackdown. This is just absolutely despicable. Mm -hmm. um, this was on Fox News. And the EPA spearheaded the proposal, said it will help tackle wasteful methane emissions from the oil and gas sector, encouraging facilities with the highest emissions to level or meet or exceed levels of performance. You're going to get taxed, which begins at 900 per metric ton of wasteful emissions in 2024 and increases to 1,200 for 2025 and 1,500 for 20 and 26. I just had another great interview with um, some folks, and this is a lot of money to the oil and gas industry. Unbelievable. Well, again, it's going to put the smaller companies out of business and it's going to lock in large, you know, you know, large international companies. I mean, when it comes down to it, Chevron, Exxon and BP love these type of rules. Oh, sure. Yeah. Add a little tax on there. You know who can't stand it? The 90 percent of oil and gas operators who are considered small cap. So they don't account for a large amount of production. But what they do account for is a large amount of you know, and they do actually account for a large amount of production relative to what the big companies do. But I think this is where I always talk 50 about percent of the oil, Michael, in the country is made by private companies. Yeah, but I'm talking about your mom and pop, your mom and pop operators, the companies that, you know, the guys that are supplying, you know, are selling 15 loads, you know, 150 loads a month versus are doing 2 million barrels of oil a day. What I'm saying is Exxon loves it when they come out with this. There's a reason why right. the API who is funded by the large oil and gas companies have come out for a carbon tax. You think it's because they like the carbon tax? Well, no, it's because eight companies provide their funding and all eight of those companies would love nothing more than to raise the cost of oil and gas slightly to the point where it drives out their competitors and allows them to acquire them at yeah. half the cost. Your second order and third order of magnitude are creeping up in these regulatory issues that I've been looking at, Michael. They have. Are you ready? Uh, the first um, class one, class two, and class three it is absolutely bonkers on what they're doing in those. And then this goes in with their regulatory issues of shutting down coal that we just talked about. Germany is bringing all their coal back online. Uh, the Biden administration is cutting all of our coal plants quickly. Yep. Nope. I'm with Oops. you. So off to you. All right. Well, before we go ahead and dive into finance, guys, we've got to pay the bills around here. Um, this show is sponsored by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis, I say that in quotes, um, that, you're, that you've heard um, are courtesy that website. Stu and the team do a fantastic job of making sure that website stays up to speed with everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and oil and gas business. You could check out the description below uh, for all the links to the articles. You can also see the timestamps uh, available if you want to bop around, go back, listen to one of our segments, pop ahead, and here's what's happening with rig counts. Um, you can also e uh, check out um, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, uh, the best place for all your data energy news combo. We're going to be pushing that hard here in Q1, so we appreciate all the feedback there. Uh, you can email the show questions at energynewsbeat.com. Sign up for our sub stack um, on our website. You can also sign up for our email newsletter. Um, but as always, guys, we appreciate you checking out the show. But let's move to finance. I, I you know, I think from an oil and gas standpoint, we saw on Friday prices rise, mainly off the fact that there was some oil being diverted from the Red Sea after we, you know, the U.S. takes an interesting move and goes ahead and, attend, you know, does a strike on the Hooties, um, which, you know, Lindsey Graham, you know, loving that, um, you know, you know, inches us closer to me getting drafted. So if all of a sudden, if I, if I don't show up one day, just know I've been drafted into World War Three um, and Stu will take over the show from there. Um but what's interesting was the fact that um, prices rose, and then we saw really at about noon, 
prices just diverted back down. And we only ended up about a quarter of a percentage point relative to where it opened. We, we opened around $72, ran all the way up to a little bit above $75 off the back of this news. And then while Treasury yields... Um, fell off the back that um, the producer price index fell. We saw oil prices naturally come down to where they closed at, at 72.68. We looked to open somewhere a little bit above that, specifically um, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to what happened this weekend, it seems like we're probably going to have a gap up as we record this on the 14th in the afternoon. So I think what you're going to see is a gap up where we'll probably, as you listen to this on Monday, probably seen prices rise uh, and, and be above that, that, that $73, that mark. That would be my guess. I think on the natural gas side with this cold weather, we've seen just boop, 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 boop. We're all the way up to $3.33. I expect to see that roll over and, and probably somewhere around that $3 and 4 uh, $3.50 mark as, as as we roll through the night session into the 15th. Um, you know, it's it just absolutely, um, and all this cold weather is absolutely going to help push prices up in the short term. Hopefully no no pipes freeze. And this is, you know, throughout the Rockies, if, if we see a freeze that causes oil production to shut down, it takes a while for that to come online. So I think that's the storyline to follow within here is how much of this cold weather throughout the Midwest knocks off oil and gas production. You know, you've got a lot of mid-continent natural gas. You've got a lot of, of oil that's producing that Oklahoma, you know, bandwidth um, that, that, that runs up down and, and, and then down into Texas in that mid-continent area. So how much of that gets knocked offline? How quickly can it come back? You definitely will see prices rise in the short term. You know, reading the headlines, Stu, the only other interesting thing on Friday I saw, we saw rig counts drop, um, you know, uh, by two from week over week. So uh, 619, again, that's a drop of two relative to last week, down from 156 from last year. Canada saw an increase of 88 rigs. Internationally, we saw a drop of 23. So, you know, the, the, the rig count continues to be an interesting story um and, and in the u.s we continue to see the that rig count kind of tick 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 down it'll be interesting to see where it goes um that's all i've got Stu. what else you got for us well hey we just released uh two really really cool uh podcasts one with mm -hmm. uh hugo kruger he is a international uh, really, really good thought leader. Uh, he was in Paris when I interviewed him and then he is from South Africa. Great episode. Then also a shout out to Doug Sandridge. Uh, wow. He is the, uh, executive director for the oil and gas executives, uh, that support nuclear and he and Chris Wright and I are going to be doing a podcast here in the next few months, a uh, pretty big one about how, uh, Liberty Energy is really becoming a leader in that. So pretty cool stuff. Love us some Liberty Energy. Chris Wright, the CEO over there. We we really yeah. enjoy that. Um, cool. We're cat. also going to be releasing, um, we've released our latest deal spotlight episode number yep. three for all of you minerals junkies. We need to, we need to do more of a public post on that. So we'll get out. We'll probably, now I was really looking at the Apache Callan deal they're a little bit vague on the number of uh, locations that they've got available. So I'm going to have to do a little back calculation to figure Oh, well, it's never a good sign when they don't tell you how many locations they've got. Yeah. It's not Ooh. a good sign because that's, that's why you're buying, you, you're buying these public mergers are based off the undeveloped locations. I mean, that's the only right. thing. If you're buying it for the PDP value, who they way overpaid. So we will look to see there are, there are some other deals, obviously the Southwestern, wow. Um, a Chesapeake deal we need to look at, but that, that, that there's a little bit more to that deal than necessarily just undeveloped locations. But um, we will break it all down. We're getting fired up for Nape guys, so go ahead um, and reach out to us, Nape at sandstone-group.com, if you are interested in uh, in hooking up with us up there. We're going to be doing a bunch of live podcasts, probably be doing some live deal valuations with our friends over at Well Database and Combo Curve. Shout out to. Uh, um, um, both of those guys for, for, for some swag. Um, and, and we will go ahead and do that. But, uh, with that guys, we'll let you get out of here, get back to work, start your Monday. Hopefully you stay warm. Um, you know, depending on whether you guys are, are forced to go back into the office or not, but, but, but stay warm, uh, stay hydrated. Stu, hope you feel a little bit better. You're playing a little less uh, sick right now. So we appreciate you filling in, but, uh, we'll let you guys get out of here. We'll see you Tuesday. Thank <laughs> you.